So I'll start recording a little bit early here, but I'll flip through to where we left off last time. Um, maybe I'll hit some of the key points along the way. So uh, one of the key points as we we're going through this is that we're representing the entire joint PDF is this weighted sum of impulses, which is very weird and on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's, it's very clever because when we end up with this very complicated high dimensional thing that ends up being parameterized by these scalar weights where at any given time there's only as many of them as you have particles and then we've got our state trajectories where the states have been from time zero up to time n for each one of the particles and one of the things I realized in preparing for the lecture today is that um, I, you know, the, the notation becomes really cumbersome because there's so many things that I have to index at different times and I, it's inevitable that I'm going to end up overloading it sometimes. My notation is different than a lot of the references I've provided you, but one of the things that I've overloaded is in when it's a subscript is always used to denote the time index. That's really the independent variable driving the, the state dynamics. But I'm also using a lowercase n to denote the number of things, such as the number of particles, or as we'll see a little bit later, the number of effective particles. And, uh, and so just, just be wary that when there's a subscript on n, it's usually denoting the number of something. But if there's no subscript, and it itself is a subscript, as is the case here, then it's usually denoting the time index, or, or here, for example. I apologize for the confusion, but there's, in, in this class, there's, just, there's a lot of things to keep track of. So it's inevitable that, that some of those notational problems emerge, I think. Um, so all we've got is parameters. Um, we saw uh, one of the things often overlooked is the partitioning of the, um, the importance density is partitioned in such a way that you can draw samples recursively. You don't have to go back and redraw um, sample trajectories from scratch. And so there's a couple choices that are made, and usually uh, in the references they just say, well, we're going to pick the importance density so it only relies on, on the, these things where there's a few things that are done by choice that, that were said without comment. And we threw that in detail last time. Uh, we end up with uh, the weights being the ratio. We went through some math, and we found out that we had a nice recursion for the weights. It was, was actually quite tidy, where the weight at time n is equal to what the weight was at the previous time sample for that particular particle trajectory, uh, multiplied by the likelihood comes from the process model, multiplied by the, uh, I'm sorry, from the measurement model, multiplied by what I'm calling the prior, which um, comes directly <coughs> from the process model, divided by the importance density update, which we get to pick. And so you know what all three of them are, and, and that's our, our weight update. So it's quite, quite tidy after getting through all the math. Um, and nice. And again, I will say more about how to pick an importance density a little bit later. So we end up with a joint, uh, we need the marginal, but it turns out because we've got this representation of impulses, calculating for the marginal, the marginal from the joint ends up being trivial. It ends up being effectively the same form. We just integrate the state trajectory from time zero to time n minus one, and all these impulses just simply integrate out, and we end up with a sum of, of just this single impulse. It's still multidimensional because the state uh, at any given time is usually a multidimensional thing. So this is still not a scalar Dirac impulse, but nonetheless it's far simpler than this impulse that is based on the entire trajectory. This is just the state at one particular time. So marginal ends up being in exactly the same form with exactly the same weights, which is great. So if you took that posterior, which is just a bunch of impulses, and you wanted to do a kernel smoother to look at the PDF, um, you would need to sort them in order. You've been reading ahead. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I'll actually cover that in today's lecture. We're going to talk about kernel smoothing. Um, but um, it, it's faster if you do that, it turns out. You're right about that. So the short answer is yes, but I'll say much more about that soon. soon. It's part of what we're talking about today. So I think this is where we left <coughs> off. Um, and this is the simplest of the particle filtering algorithms. Uh, I think this was the last slide we covered, and uh, it's, it's quite simple. There's, um, this is simply a, a shorthand expression that tells you how to get from the measurements at time n, knowing what the state was at time n minus 1 for each of the particles, and what the weights are for each of the particles at time n minus 1, getting from that information 
to what the particle is at time n for each of the particles and what the weights are at time n for each of the particles. So this is really how do you take that one step forward. And, um, and so, you know, for each particle, we do a loop over the number of particles, or if you've got enough parallel processors, which you'll never have, but if you do, uh, then you could do some of this, and you could actually do all this in parallel. You simply um, advance the particle one step ahead by drawing it from your importance density. You know, you got to pick what this was, and I'll say more about how to pick that shortly, but you pick the importance density, and it can be conditioned on a measurement if you like, or the previous state if you like, or it doesn't have to be. It's up to you. It's one of your design decisions that you'll need to defend when you're presenting your homework and presenting your projects and when you apply this stuff um, in, in the real world. Um, you then calculate the unnormalized weights, which are simply, again, the product of the um, likelihood, and this is where your measurement comes in. That's where your measurement has effects on your weights uh, or on your estimates of the particles. It's not in the particles themselves, but in the weights those particles get. Those that are unlikely, this will be a small number, and those weights will go down. The particles that where, where you choose the state where it's likely will have a high like, higher likelihood, and those weights won't go down as much. So it's at this step that the measurement to time in is, is really taken into account and, uh, and affects the relative, the relative weights of each of the particles. Um, likewise, uh, when you're looking at your process model and your prior and thinking about that, that information, it's only the um, probable state transitions from time n minus 1 to n where this number will be reasonably large and where those weights will remain large. If you, have a, if, you, if you draw a sample, and this starts to give you a hint about how to pick your importance density, if you chose an importance density where you pick the state that's completely different uh, than where it was at n minus 1 and it's completely inconsistent with your, your prior knowledge exp expressed by your process model, then this probability will be a very small number, and it will drive that weight down. So you can see it's the product of the likelihood and the process model. And in order to, for that trajectory to have a large weight, both of those have got to be large. Otherwise, it, it will rapidly drive that weight to zero, and it won't have much influence on your estimates. And we've got the previous weights, and then, again, all, all divided by your importance density, because we're doing Monte Carlo integration, and, and we have to um, weight things by how probable it was that, that you would have chosen that. So, so in that case, those two important densities are the same because they have different subscripts? You said two important densities. Are you talking about you're this one and this one? one important density, and then you're normalizing by another important density, or at least the, the subscripts are different. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. So, so this is intended to be a PDF where the independent variable is x of n, and you're, you're drawing from that yeah. distribution. And I've, you know, I've labeled that xn. Um, I, I guess I could have labeled that x or something else, but it's a PDF where this is the independent variable. This equation in the bottom now is not a PDF that you're drawing from, but rather we're evaluating the PDF at that particular um, particle. So the reason that this has doesn't have a superscript is that we're just drawing from that and assigning that to the particle. So that's why there's a difference um, in the superscript where, where it's not showing up there, but it is showing up here. Um, you're right that down here I've shown 0 to n minus 1 and 0 to, to n, so I've shown this in its more general form, and, uh, and I probably shouldn't have because that's just causing confusion. Um, it, uh, it, 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 I, I should have used the same, so I, I, I should probably update the slides where I eliminate that 0 colon and 0, zero colon for both of those um, subscripts. And then uh, once we've calculated the weights for each of the particles, um, then we just go through and normalize them. And this is the only step that you can't really parallelize because you have to bring together the information from all the different particles and add all the weights and then uh, normalize in this step. But of all the computation, this is not the step where most of the computation is going. So maybe if you're massively parallel, it might be, but <coughs> I doubt it. Taking uh, normalizing by sum is unlikely to be a limiting factor. Okay, so um, any questions on this simple algorithm? So every every time step we're getting new particles, or we're using the same particles and propagating them all the way through? At every time step, we're propagating the particles one step forward into the future. But we're using the entire past trajectories that we've generated before. So the, that drawing, the drawing only happens for the first step, but then as we go through, we count, we count 
Well, um, this drawing occurs at every time step, but we're only drawing what the state will be at time n uh, from what it was at time n minus 1. So, but, but we are drawing a, a set of random numbers, um, and the number of numbers depends on the dimension of your state vector as, as well. So let's say you're, you're drawing random vectors, and you're drawing how many of them that you have, uh, however many particles you have, you're drawing that many random vectors to advance it one step ahead into the future from where it was. And what you're drawing from is conditioned on the previous particles. Correct. Uh, what's actually only the previous particle? Like, each draw is from a different Q because the, con the conditional on a different, uh, you know, uh, I is different. Yeah, that's a good point. You're right, you're right. Well, did you have something too? I was just gonna say the exact same thing. Each particle has its own importance density, right? Is the takeaway there. Because I assumed originally you were using one importance density for all the particles, yeah. which is wrong, apparently. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a choice, but in general, a good choice it's going to turn out is that you, you want it to be different, that this is going to be part of what determines what that probability is. So yeah, you're right. Okay, great. <coughs> All right, so an example. Uh, another, another example, this isn't quite real data yet, um, but it's, um, I think it's a good example for showing how you go from domain knowledge to, um, to actually putting this into a state space framework and being able to track with it. So this is something I made up. Um, and I, when I made it up, I had no idea how well it was going to work. But it turned out to, to work really well in the sense that it enabled me to illustrate some really important concepts for this class. So you know, I wasn't deliberately trying to do anything. I was just trying to think of an example. I, um, in my research, I do a lot of tracking of movement with sensors. And so I'm thinking a lot about um, where things are, are located. And so I created an example that's kind of a little bit like that, but I had to keep it one-dimensional, and that, that made it a little bit tricky, because usually when you're looking at movement, it's only interesting if you're at least in two dimensions. So, um, so I've got a race car driving around <coughs> a track, and driving around a track, it's one-dimensional. The position on the track could be expressed as a phase angle um, representing where the car is, but it's, it's going, around, going around in circles at, at some rate. Um, so we've got, and, it, and it's a fast car, it's a race car. <laughs> so it's quickly going around the track. Uh, the track has a radius of 200 meters, uh, which <coughs> seems reasonable, I think. I don't race cars, but it seems like that would be reasonable. Um, at nearly maximum velocity, and I, you know, I, I should have done the math because I don't actually know what this rate would be in like kilometers per hour, miles per hour, but, um, but I said the speed of the car is nearly two degrees per second. Maybe someone can tell me if that's fast or not, because I don't actually know if it is. Maybe it's a slow car. <coughs> it's going around at roughly two degrees per second, but it's changing lanes a little bit. We're not going to model the lanes, but you know, it's slowing down, speeding up, as it has to pass cars that are on the same line somehow. Maybe it drives over them, I'm not sure. But, um, but the, the main point is it's not a constant velocity. It's average velocity. It's mean velocity is two degrees per second. Um, we've got a sensor located not, not inside the track, but we've got a sensor out of here. And all that sensor does is relative to some Earth reference frame, let's say Y is pointed maybe towards uh, the North Pole and X is uh, along the lines of uh, latitude. So this is, I guess, pointing east. And, um, and we've got a sensor located right here. And all I can tell you about that sensor is it tells me what the angle is. It's constantly pointed at the car. <coughs> But the only information I'm getting is what the angle is relative to east. Maybe I should have made that north. Maybe that'd be easier conceptually. But north is always up. So let's say relative to east. So relative to the x-axis, I know what the angle is of the car, what the sort of bearing angle is, is I think what that's usually called. So I know the bearing angle. And, and I know I've got a car. I've got some <coughs> state dynamics because I know it's going around roughly at 2 degrees um, per second. And um, my sensor for measuring this bearing angle isn't very good. It's only good to within roughly plus or minus five degrees, um, typically. So that's the information I have. Um, the one bit of information that's missing that I'll add later that I should have added to this slide is I said nearly constant, but I didn't say anything about the variation in the speed, and I should have. So I, I, I'll, you'll see I added that in later in my assumptions, but assume I've got some idea about the variability of the speed of the car as well, somehow. The or at least, like, the, pardon? The car's going like six 
that's not very it's fast. Not super good top speed. Okay, so I got and maybe I, I got to speed it up next year, or or maybe later this term I'll I'll do a faster car. Thank you for <coughs> calculating that and showing me that my race car is no good. <laughs> <laughs> I got a really poor race car. Samples more slowly. <laughs> All right, so um, so we got to design a tracker. Um, I didn't say anything about the sample rates. Uh, I probably should have included that as well. But uh, I think my assumption is I'm sampling at, at one sample per second, so it's probably a good thing that that car is moving so slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not getting into any problems with Nyquist. Okay, so, um, so the goal kind of comes down to estimating where's the car, and I can express that as a phase angle. You know, where's the car, this, this phi in, and, and you know, I'm not quite representing it right, because I, I think phi in is probably relative to the east, but here, you know, by this diagram, it looks like phi is relative to the west uh, angle, and that's uh, not quite right. But, um, but the kind of the steps you go through for, for doing this math are, are not going to be largely affected by that. So, um, given that what we know is not phi, but instead we're measuring theta, we're measuring the bearing angle down here, but what we're really interested in estimating is phi. And keep in mind, we're measuring this bearing angle, but it's not just a math problem, because we're not measuring this very well. We're getting pretty lousy measurements. We have an idea, but they're, they're not very good. So, uh, one of the decisions that I'll make again and again, and most of you will make probably in your homework <coughs> and in your projects, is that in the absence of any other information, you know, all we were told is that, you know, within five degrees roughly is how good your sensor is. I wasn't told anything about the distribution. I wasn't even told what its standard deviation, what its variance is. But when you get that kind of information as part of a problem statement or, or when your uh, manager, uh, your um, manager who didn't get an engineering degree or, or maybe didn't do well in engineering school and that's why uh, she became she or he became a manager then um, then that would be uh, that's the information you have to work with and so you being good engineers would probably say something like um, the five degrees is a standard deviation or two standard deviations or three standard deviations some number of standard deviations in this case I'm treating it as a single standard deviation and I'm modeling it is normally distributed because of the central limit theorem. In the absence of anything else, that's usually your, your go-to distribution. Um, so then we've still got to create a measurement model. This is not expressed in terms of the state variable that we're trying to estimate, the phi, but in terms of the theta. So then we just go through some geometry in this case. In other applications, you may use other domain knowledge for getting at that. But in going through a little bit of geometry, we know um, where our sensor that's giving us the bearing angle is located relative to the center of the track. And with just a little bit of geometry that I don't think I need to walk you through, um, we can figure out how theta is related to the x and y coordinates, and we can figure out how the x and y coordinates are related to the, um, the position of the car on the track. And if you put all those together, um, you know, we end up with uh, our measurement model then being the arc tangent of the ratio of these two plus noise. If you substitute these two equations in, then we end up with um, this as our measurement model. So, and, and again, I'm assuming normal distribution. I took the five degrees uncertainty and modeled that simply as a standard deviation. So that's how I use geometry and domain knowledge to design a measurement model. And as engineers, a lot of your time in applying these types of signal processing techniques is going to, be, is, is going to go into the model design and making sure that your model is as accurate as, as, you, as it can be. Um, the measurement model is always coming from domain knowledge. And, uh, and again, like in this example, often you have to make broad approximations. I, you know, I chose normal distribution. I chose five to be a standard deviation. Those are assumptions. And once you've got some actual data, there are ways of checking to see if those assumptions were reasonable or not. But in the absence of data or other information, then you usually have to start with that kind of design process to create your model. So I'll say more about the, the process of uh, model design a little bit later, but it's always specific to your application. And, and it, it, it usually... Um, it, it takes some experience. It's hard to teach in general because it's not like, here's the algorithm, here's all the math behind it. It, it varies from one problem to the next. Not unlike controls problems. I know a lot of you have a background in controls. Is it, um, I mean, just didn't follow every, everything. I mean, obviously it works out as a 
noise doesn't change at all, that's still the same VN, even though it's now expressed in terms of our the, the variable that we want to estimate. It's, yeah. It doesn't get like scaled or modified based on something because we've kind of changed variables now into this other angle. Yep, yep, yep. You're, you're all right. And this kind of relates to the the question we had earlier. Um, the uh, This whole thing here is just theta. It's the bearing angle that we measure. So it's just, yeah, and the information we had anymore. was that we get that bearing angle with a certain amount of resolution that was in units of degrees. Okay. And so the, the information we had about the measurement noise was, was kind of assuming... That, uh, that we had added noise, which I guess is another thing that, that I included in the model but, but didn't explicitly justify. But when we're told, you know, it's only good to within roughly five degrees, modeling that is additive noise. If it's additive noise, it's got to have the same units as whatever your measurement is. So, yeah, the, the fact that I then took theta and expressed theta through this nonlinear function in terms of phi the state variable that we're actually interested in tracking didn't change the fact that added measurement noise has the same units of y then, no, no impact at all. So if we were told that somebody was pulling this instrument that measures the bearing, they have some noise and how it's moving around, then that would be, you have to transform that to get it to be added when it gets scanned. Well, I, I want to make sure I got this straight. You, you now have the, the bearing angle on a mobile platform yeah. that's moving around? Yeah, but it's moving around with additive Gaussian noise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that would make it more interesting. If you've got a mobile platform, yeah, this problem would become quite a bit more complicated because you probably need to but model the dynamics of how that moves, and that would probably be folded into your state yeah. vector. Well, let's say we keep it simple, though, and you could just say that um, the, the position of where the, uh, the place is moving is moving as a, as a white noise. It doesn't have any, it's, it's pure white noise. You don't have to worry about adding any states. Right, then can we just model it as being a, a transformation of the variance of the phi there? Right. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. I'm, I'm still trying to think through the idea that you're, you're, you're attributing the source of this added noise to the fact that every sample, which I guess is at one hertz, so every second your platform is moving around by five degrees. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So what I'm saying is you can, you can transform the, 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 the error in translation into an error in bearing. And then keep treating it you as could. You could. The, the thing is, if it was, if it really was a uniform distribution that the platform was moving around in, then I, um, I doubt that your bearing error would end up being Gaussian. You, you may be able to do better by figuring out what the distribution of that actually is. There might, there might be a better way to approach that. I mean, you, you could. It's kind of a first order approximation, but if that's really the source of your error, and you know that the movement really is <coughs> uniform, or even if it was Gaussian. Um, translating that to bearing angle, I doubt the distribution of the equivalent noise in the bearing angle would still be Gaussian. So it may not, that may not really be the limiting factor in, in the tracking accuracy. You may just say, it's okay. <laughs> it's close enough. Um, okay. You guys with me? Doing another one-dimensional example. So this is our measurement model. State-space model always has the measurement model and the process model. So we've got We've got half of it. Um, so we need the process model. Well, all we know uh, is that the car is going around at, at apparently a very slow, constant rate of omega, uh, of, I think I said, 2 degrees per second, um, and, or 2 degrees per sample. I guess I expressed it in units of per sample. So maybe the sample rate is 100 hertz, and that thing's flying around. <laughs> I saved. <laughs> um, I'm glad I didn't. I'm, I'm glad I had that in there. Now I don't have to go remember to go back and correct my slides. I'm just fast sample rate is actually going quite fast. Or or do I have to make the sample rate really slow? I think if it's uh, 100 hertz, the driver might fly out the window, and the car is just gonna. 10 hertz. Yeah. Okay, 10 hertz. <laughs> 10 hertz sample rate. Maybe, Thank you. Maybe it is a one hertz. Uh, passed out. <laughs> yeah. Driver's unconscious. I think it did say two. It's degrees. a Tesla. <laughs> it's a two degrees per second on the previous slide, so you already locked yourself oh, in. Oh, all so, right, yeah. all right. So maybe, I gotta, maybe I gotta go back. A one hertz sample rate, but the car is going 362 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good, okay. That's what On a 200 the, meter uh, track. The radius bigger. Wow, 1500 meters a second? All right. Like <laughs> <a> <laughs> <laughs> Enough fun, you guys get it. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so if, if there was no variation in the speed, then at some sample rate, if, if I was able to get a mega into degrees per sample, whatever that works out to be, then we know the phase, um, the phase angle, or the, the angle of the car, the position of the car, would go at time n to time n plus 1, it would increase by whatever omega is. And it increases by that amount of degrees per sample, so <coughs> the phase at n to n plus 1 would, would simply increase. But this thing is fluctuating. And you could model, um, you could model the rate. It probably would have been better, better to model the rate as though it's fluctuating about some mean. And, uh, and it may go higher, it may go lower. But what I chose to do in this case uh, is simply say um, these fluctuations are completely random from one sample to the next. It's not really kind of speeding up over some number of samples and slowing down. We have knowledge that the rate is changing also within some bounds. You know, you then maybe model the acceleration. But to keep it into a single dimension, I just I, I went to additive noise again. So additive noise is the stochastic model that I chose. On average, if you take the expected value of the right-hand side, the phase is still going to increase by omega because this has an expected value of zero. So it's still going at the same, it's increasing at the same average rate, but now I'm allowing that to fluctuate by some amount. And, uh, and so, you know, again, we were not told what the distribution is. And it's much harder, typically, to get at a model of your process noise than it is your measurement noise. You can usually characterize your measurement sensor. And you can usually take some measurements when the state is not changing and get an idea of how that thing performs and what its distribution is. But with the process, you usually don't have a direct m measurement of it. And so this requires um, more careful modeling. And again, we've got our go-to distribution based on the central limit theorem flag uh, that I'll wave once again. Zero mean, because we know, we know what the mean is, and we've already modeled that. So then the one remaining question is, what's the variance? And that would, um, that would typically come from some data, but in this case, in the absence of data, um, I, just, I chose a value. And the value that I chose was uh, 10 pi. Uh, over 180. So I'm, I'm expressing this in units of radians rather than degrees. Um, no. Yeah, that's that's right. So I guess I guess it would be 10 degrees would be the equivalent. So um, so that's what I chose for the process noise. And given that, we then arrive at our at the complete state space model. And again, with some practice and experience, um, you'll get better at this. You may even get better at this than me. I'm not an expert at modeling. But you can, I was trying to talk through what the steps were by which we um, arrived at the measurement model, which I think was, was kind of more rigorous and, uh, and more directly related to domain knowledge that we had. And then we've got the process model, where we often have to use good judgment where we know that uh, it's going around at an average rate and, uh, and there's some variation. And I probably would have modeled this differently if I could do it in multiple dimensions where I would have probably said the acceleration may be more erratic. It may be more appropriately modeled as a, like a white noise process. But that would mean that the velocity wouldn't change quite so abruptly. Right now, I'm, it's, you know, it's kind of jerking back and forth. It's a very jerky type of movement. And really, the dynamics are probably smoother than that. And, and you could model that if you, had, if you could use more state dimensions. But I'm trying to keep it to a single dimension so we can compare it to the optimal tracker for the sake of um, illustrating the ideas. So, um, so we've got a complete description. The only thing that I left off here was um, our prior knowledge about the state at time zero. But it's, if it's in a race, then we know where it is at time zero. So we've got really good knowledge. And I'm sorry I didn't state that on the slide. That's, that's the only thing I think that makes this incomplete. Because we've got the process model, the measurement model, the distribution of the noise terms are down here. Uh, the only thing that I left off is what's, the, what's your prior knowledge of what the state is at time zero? What's the mean and what's the, the variance? So basically, how much confidence do you have in whatever your estimate is? And this, this might be going backwards. Oh, correct. Because the variance is 10, so there's like right, 60% of the time it's going to be, well, I mean, your, your bounds or that, that, that normal distribution there where you might be going minus 8. On, uh, on average, six. it goes 2 degrees forward, but you're quite right that the process noise is large quite enough large. that there's a good chance that it could be going backwards for a number of consecutive samples. 
And it was fortuitous. When I was uh, cooking up this example, um, again, I was just trying to think of something that was uh, was different than what I had already covered before. You know, I was trying to think of, I, I just made it up. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad I chose these numbers um, because when you, when you track with this, again, it actually illustrates some really cool ideas. And it's very simple. And again, I didn't, I didn't cook this up with, with really anything uh, in mind in terms of what it would be useful for. It turns out to be really good. So um, now we've got to apply our particle filter. So we did our model design. I, I want you to keep in mind there's always kind of two big stages. There's um, the engineering that goes around designing your model or characterizing your model, um, coming up with a good state space model that represents whatever it is you're trying to track. And then you've got some decisions to make on your particle filter. Um, so you've got some design decisions, and you're going to need to be able to defend that by the, by the end of the term. Um, I see uh, PhD students uh, graduating from this college uh, in unnamed disciplines where they're using particle filters uh, for tracking something or other. And when they do their dissertation defense, they often gloss over some important details, like, well, what did you pick for your importance density and why? Uh, how many particles did you use and why? How did you justify that? Um, there, there's important questions that they, it seems that the PhD students are just, in some cases, pulling them out of, out of a book or something they read and, and applying it kind of blindly without really understanding it. So I hope those of you that go on to a PhD um, will, will avoid that after taking this class. So for the importance density, um, in this case, because we haven't talked about how to pick that, I said, it's up to you, you can do anything you want. Um, it turns out that both an easy choice and what we'll see later, a pretty good choice, is to use your process model. So what I chose in this case is I could have chosen this just to be a uniform distribution or a normal distribution or a Cauchy or anything I wanted where it really didn't depend on the prior state of the measurements at all. The math would still work. It would still track. The performance may not be great, but you, you really are at liberty to make this thing anything you want. But a very common choice is to make this equal to your process model. It's very simple. Usually with your process model, it's very easy to simulate data. It's a really good idea to have a process model where you can simulate data, and you usually want to track simulated data to make sure that it's tracking reasonably, as reasonably as you would expect with synthetic data. So usually you already have this, and, and this is usually in a form where you can easily synthesize data great random numbers, do the math, and advance the state forward and repeat. It's, it's very, usually a very simple thing to do. So this is a common choice where you set your importance density equal to the prior. It's not optimal, but it's common. It's pretty good, it turns out. So that's one decision we have to make. That's the decision I'm going to make in this case. So the importance density is for each particle, the car is going to be advanced forward exactly the same way that the process model would, would expect it to go forward, including the noise. Um, you also have to decide the number of particles, and um, one of the mistakes I've made uh, in, in the previous times I've taught this course, I think, is that um, I'm often, for the sake of illustration and for teaching, I'm often um, working in a one-dimensional space, and in a one-dimensional space you don't need that many particles. Um, and in a lot of practical applications, one of the things I'll ask you to do is read a paper from the literature where people are using particle filters to track something. What you'll see is often they're using like 50,000 particles. I'm using 500 in this example. And 500 <coughs> is probably ample because I'm only trying to cover a one-dimensional space at any given time. And so you think of a density estimate, and there's probably uh, a countable number of modes trying to represent two, three modes in a one-dimensional space with 500 particles is reasonable. But when you're doing your projects at the end of the term, you're going to want to think about how many modes do I think I probably have in my posterior, how high of dimensional space am I in, and how much computation can I afford, because I've got to turn this in tomorrow, and you know, 50,000 particles is going to take 48 hours to complete or something. So you start to run into some practical constraints as well. So the usual approach in practice, what people do is they, they, they bound it on computation. The more particles, the better. Um, the, the result of this theory is asymptotic, which means you need an infinite number of particles to truly be optimal, which you'll never have. And so practically what engineers do is they say, um, 
well, look, I, could, I, I, I couldn't afford to run this for more than 12 hours, and that turns out to be about 50,000 particles. So usually the rationale for this is, is based on how much time you have or how much computation you have, or the combination of the two, computational energy. Um, and, then, uh, and then you've got to pick an estimate of the state, and we've talked about this. Um, the most common choice is the mean. The mean may not be a good choice if you've got a multimodal posterior, and you're going to need to investigate and figure out whether you've got a multimodal posterior and whether you want to use maybe a median or something else. Um, in this case, um, I'm using the mean because it'll be useful for illustrating a, a teaching point more than that it's a good choice for tracking but there's a point I want to make, and the, the mean makes it easy. And if I plotted everything, um, it, would, it would be too messy. I'm already going to have very busy plots. Okay. How are you guys doing on attention? Are we all right? Oh. Pardon? Edge of the seat. Okay. All right. I'm not going to stop quite yet, then. Good. All right. So um, here are the measurements. Uh, and if you look at these measurements, you're like, oh, my gosh, that thing looks flat. I mean, one of the things I love about this um, is that if you sit back, for a lot of signal processing problems, you can often look at, look at it and say, well, the estimate ought to be about there. And you can usually eyeball, like if you're doing a detection problem, you can usually look at, at, um, at a plot of the signal and be like, oh, it's clearly occurring there, 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 and there. You can usually like manually annotate it. Um, and for a lot of estimation problems, you can be like, well, I, I can clearly tell from looking at, at some image or, or something that the submarine is right there, the whale is right there. This is what the algorithm should be estimating, and you can eyeball it. Um, but with these state-space tracking techniques, often when you look at the measurement signal that you actually have to work with, here's the measurement signal, is this blue line. And if I, you know, I, I took away this, this uh, plot with the red line where you can see the actual state. But if I just gave you that blue line, I said, okay, eyeball it guess what the state is based on that blue line. Like, it would be hopeless, I think. But, but the scale doesn't help. You would the scale doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, you might be able to scale and zoom in and do a little bit of math and say, well, okay, I think roughly kind of a rough maximum likelihood it ought to be around here. Um, but in a lot of signal processing problems, with, without a lot of scaling, even just visualizing it, you can estimate where it is. You know, a lot of these state space things, you can't. I think even if I zoomed in on that blue, blue signal and scaled it differently, probably even with a little bit of math, you'd have a heck of a time telling me what the state was, I think. Again, we sort of, we, the, the why, the observation that we're making is the, the vertical distance, it's why... It's bearing angle. It's bearing angle. So you can imagine so, so someone with a camera... It's expected to be pretty flat because it's just going back and forth in this small range, right? As it yeah, goes... It depends on how far away it is from the track and the diameter of the track. But, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it's going to be sweeping back and forth almost like a swing. Yeah, yeah you're right. You can imagine uh, a camera person that is pointed at the car and you've put um, a potentiometer or something on the swivel right. so that you can see what the bearing angle and maybe the camera person has crosshairs and is like tracking the, the very slow, very boring race car, uh, slowly making its way around the track. So yeah, that's effectively what we're looking at. Yeah, so it, it certainly wouldn't have, this is something I was kind of struggling with before, but it's, it's not, you have this transform between your observations and the state, right? Because yeah, I mean, you're not even observing what the, you know, the state is. That's right. right? Yeah, so I mean, the state, you want to see it like, maybe go up and constantly increase and but it's observation important. is going to be just this like small movement or something like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. But in, in my mind, I think that's what makes it so cool because you're just going back and forth. But we know there's something that's going around a loop and we're trying to estimate where is it and the loop and really how many times has it gone around the loop. You know, when we think of phase, we usually think in a phase where it's, where it's wrapped or it's, uh, is it wrapped or unwrapped? I guess it's wrapped. And so zero degrees and 360 degrees are the same, kind of, kind of like you were saying before. But in this case, it's an unwrapped phase, so 360 and zero are not the same. I'm actually calculating how many revolutions it's gone around the track. Yeah. So, so X, X N is their phi, phi N? Correct. Yeah, that's the state in this case. And, and forgive me, I don't remember exactly how I scaled this. It looks like both of these are in units of degrees. This is undoubtedly in degrees. And it looks like this is in degrees. It's going, although it's going, to, what did I say, two degrees on average per 
per sample. So to go 360 would take 180 <coughs> seconds. We're looking at roughly half of that, and it goes uh, almost 360. Uh, so I guess it's going a little bit faster than average. I think that I think that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is right. So um, so that, that that's the true state. And again, it's good engineering practice once you have your model designed to actually create synthetic data and then track that synthetic data and see how well it works. Don't simply design your model and immediately go to the actual measurement data you have where you don't know what the state is. Um, there are things you can do with measurement data alone, but you can do far more. It's a good idea to have it working with synthetic data before you, you get too, too wedded to making sure it's working well with the real data where you can't see the true state. Um, so states changing slowly over time, uh, only two degrees per second, really slow, slow car. Um, and the posterior is able to blend those two together in a way. Okay, so we generate our particles, 500 particles, and each one gets advanced at time. And you can get an idea, although I didn't state it, you can get an idea of what I used for the, um, uh, the starting state. Uh, it looks like I started it at about, uh, what is that, 45, 50 degrees around the track. So there was, there was a weird starting line, apparently, for this thing. And apparently I did have quite a bit of uncertainty, because all those particles did not start at the same point, so I guess I was suspicious that the driver might cheat, <laughs> or, or, or kind of be dumb and start, apparently, way behind the line. <laughs> I'm not sure what I was modeling there, but you can get an idea of what, what the uncertainty is. Yeah, okay. oh, very good point. Um, but it's it's neat visually that you can see what it was that I did uh, with this. And this actually works better in Python than MATLAB because you can make each of these particle trajectories more trans transparent, uh, and that makes it a little bit easier to see this overlap where it's darker. It's not just painted in the same shade of green, but it gets darker the more and more of them that you, you add together. So you can actually see the density rather than just being overwhelmed with the room. Yeah, Python's better, maybe. Um, but in any case, you can you kind of get a visual indication of where all the trajectories are. Of course, almost all these trajectories, all of them on average, are going to increase with time because they're all following that um, process model. You know, that was my choice. I chose to use the process model. So on average, they're all going to increase by two degrees. Um, but as you pointed out, uh, sometimes they're going to go down. And sometimes we're going to go up really fast uh, because we've got that process noise. We've got that uncertainty about how rapidly. And what's really interesting in this case, we, we've seen this before, and this shouldn't be too disturbing to you, but in this case, it looks like the um, actual trajectory of the car uh, for a period of time, it went to an improbable place. This turned out to be a faster car than, uh, than it would be on average, even given the measurements probably because it jumped up over this period of time, it was very fast, and it ended up being higher than any of the 500 article, particles that I generated. So that's, that was improbable, but it can happen. Uh, the state can go to improbable places. It just doesn't do it very often. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean we, we, we didn't make a mistake. This is all synthetic data. Um, so uh, um, all of you, um, are, you have access to my code, and uh, many of you are going to choose to adapt that code when you're working through the homework. And when you do that, most of you are going to be generating these plots and showing these to me for the rest of the term, and I'm going to get tired of them. Um, <laughs> this, this shows something very weird. Um, when we start off, initially all the weights have the same value. When we initialize it the way you initialize the particle filter, all the weights take on the same value. You normalize them, so if you've got 500 particles, they're all equal to 1 over 500. What is that? 2 milli. 0.002. Um, as time goes on, as we apply our particle filter tracking algorithm in its simplest form, uh, one of the things that happens is that uh, the weights get, most of the weights get smaller. The average of the weights has got to be 1. The sum of the weights has got to be 1 because we've got that constraint. We normalize them at every time step. So the sum of the weights is equal to 1. And yet, uh, the, if you look at the weights themselves, and this is on a log scale, this is 10 to the minus 50. Uh, the weights themselves, uh, all of them are headed to 0, uh, it looks like, except for 1. 1 stays high. 
All the other ways head to zero. And that's, that's not a good thing. Um, this is on a linear scale from zero to one. A weight cannot take on a value greater than one because the sum of the weights, they're, they're non-negative, and the sum of the weights is going to be equal to one. So at, at most, a weight is going to take on a value of one. And if we look at a plot of all the weights together, uh, you can see at around time 20, between <coughs> 20 and 30, something weird happens, and suddenly one of the particle gets a weight close to one, and all the other particles are zero. And then there's some kind of weird switching where it looks like two of them are kind of fighting it out, and, and one wins, it looks like it's the same one, and that weight goes back to one. And then there's kind of another fight here, maybe between three different particles, and something switches again, and then another particle wins for quite a while, and then there's some other fight with some other particle, and, and someone wins that fight. But at any given time, after about time 20, it looks like we only have one weight that is, uh, has a significant value, and all the other weights are going to a value close to zero. They all head for zero. They're all just tanking. And on a log scale, you can see, I mean, it, it happens rapidly. Again, this is 10 to the minus 50, effectively zero from an engineering standpoint. And they're all, they're all just headed down, except for, except for the winner. There's kind of one winner that gets all the weights. This is um, a measure of the variance of the weights, and uh, the expected value of the variance of the weights actually increases continuously over time. This is just a, a sample estimate, and, I, I, and I, I'll, I'll explain that more later, but, um, but something weird is happening, and, uh, and it's, it's probably not a good thing. Okay, an image. There's a lot on this image. Um, Fortunately, you've seen this before, kind of. Um, so we've got a single dimensional state, and I've plotted the state apparently on a different scale. Apparently I'm using radians. Sorry for the switch. It had to be radians, because this is going to 90 samples, and I must have done this in radians. So this is radians, uh, and I'm apparently starting off at one radian. Um, and, um, and these are the values the state can take on. This is time on the horizontal axis, the darkness of the grayscale, the underlying grayscale, just as with optimal tracking, indicates the height of the PDF at that time. We're looking at the posterior PDF, and this PDF was estimated, was calculated optimally. We talked about optimal tracking, we know how to calculate that for a single dimensional state, and that's what I did. So realistically, if you have someone handed you this problem and said, do the best you can, you would not use a particle filter, you would use the optimal tracking algorithm because it's in one dimension. Um, but I'm, we're using the particle filter to understand it. Um, the true mean calculated from the true posterior is shown by the blue. So it starts off down here and goes over, jumps up, and then uh, goes here and, and kind of finds its way up. The pink region up here is the um, upper 2.5th percentile, and this lower region is the bottom 2.5th percentile. So the region that is not shaded in pink represents a 95% confidence region based on optimal tracking. With the particle filters, uh, we can also calculate a confidence interval um, because it's, it's a representation of a PDF and getting percentiles is quite easy. So I can also estimate the 2.5th percentile, 97.5th percentile, and I'm plotting those as the yellow line. So there's an upper yellow line and a lower yellow line. And you can see it tracks beautifully for at least the first 10 samples. And then something goes haywire and it's completely off. Uh, after some point in time, but at least initially the yellow matches the edge of the pink region almost perfectly for the first 20 samples or so. Can we turn the lights off for this? Yeah, um, Fu, can I, or Scott, can I ask you to get that? Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thank you for that. So um, the yellow uh, is, uh, is right on the money for the first 20 or so samples. And uh, in the estimate of the particle mean uh, is shown by the green, and it's, it's a little hard to see. I think I can zoom in without rotating. Oh, yeah, that worked. So if you look closely, uh, that also is doing very well. The blue and the green, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty dang close. Uh, you know, for the first 20 samples or so. And then right around time 20, something goes haywire, and they diverge. And, uh, and they continue to diverge uh, and be quite different pretty much from that point forward. Um, let's see, so they, they kind of <coughs> split apart here. They both do jump up, but then the green kind of comes down and, 
goes in these very improbable places. So down here, it's estimating the state as being way down here and having a confidence region that's down here, when really the, the state, the mean, everything is, is way up there. So, you know, something's going wrong. These particle filters are not looking like they're all that they're cracked up to be. You're like, well, okay, <laughs> if this is really it, why on earth are you teaching a course on this? Um, there's, there's one other thing that I want to say about this, and it's more about, um, uh, about tracking. Um, I, I've said it before, but I, I'm going to say it again. Um, most engineers that use these techniques think of the posterior as being unimodal. In this particular example, I did not create this example expecting that I was creating another nice example of something that was multimodal, but it turned out to be. Um, and that's, I think, really cool. You know, when, with the bearing angle, when you get to the edge of the track, you can't quite, there's an ambiguity where you can't tell if you're looking at a car that's coming towards you or a car that's going away. And in these splits, that's where the bearing angle is at one of the edges of the track, and you can't, can't tell for a while where the car was going. But after a while, you get some measurements, you're like, well, the bearing angle could have only landed there subsequently if the car was moving in this direction. And so this little bifurcation right here in the posterior um, is due to that, that, uh, that nonlinearity in the measurement model. The same thing happens here where we get to the edge of the track, and I couldn't quite tell, you can't tell uh, from the posterior for a bit whether the car uh, went backwards or if it went up. It actually did end up going backwards, but from the measurement data, it's, it's ambiguous for a period of time. And then after a while, you can tell with a lot more confidence where the car is. That ambiguity goes away. Um, and that's super cool. Um, down here, it was very improbable. There was another split, and it was very improbable that the car went down here. Uh, this mode was much heavier. It had a lot more area in it uh, than the mode down here. But the main point I want to illustrate is even with this very simple example where I was not deliberately trying to grade a multimodal posterior, I ended up with one. And that's pretty common with nonlinear uh, state space models, and especially when you've got nonlinearities in your measurement model, which you usually have. So I encourage all of you, I hope one of the key things you take out of this class is to be wary before you just throw an extended Kalman filter or an extended Kalman filter at a problem, as engineers often do, to think really carefully and do some work to figure out whether there's any evidence that you might be working with a multimodal posterior or not. And it's not easy to figure out, but um, I'll show you, I'll give you some hints about how you can determine whether that, that might be the case or not. It just happened to be in this particular model. But in any case, it looks like uh, we, we've, we've got a problem. It st things start off beautifully for about, I don't know, 18 samples or so, and then something breaks down and things stop working. And we got a hint of what was going wrong when we looked at our weights. Um, but, um, but clearly the, the story isn't over. We're, we're not quite there yet. And this is probably a good stopping point. So let's, let's take a break. We'll take five minutes. And then we'll come back and I'll, I'll show you how, um, how to fix this and end up with something that's really powerful. I once argued that there's some kind of chip inside the puck and then I no longer think so. <laughs> <laughs> Due to this stuff. <laughs> you guys ready? All right. Uh, you haven't seen it work yet. <laughs> You've seen it not work. We'll make it in a second. You have an awful lot of techniques that teach us about the don't work. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, you have to understand what doesn't work to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's, there's sort of another um, uh, sort of um, tangent that we need to go on for a minute. Um, I was asked earlier about uh, kernel smoothing, but I, I assume some of you don't know what kernel smoothing is, at least for density estimation. And um, essentially the problem that we have is that we've got particle filters and we want to be able to visualize what the posterior looks like. And, and for what it's worth, a lot of engineers um, who even work with particle filters do not do this. This is not a common thing. Um, but it's very helpful, especially when you're trying to look to see whether, whether something is multimodal or not, whether a posterior is multimodal. So I'm going to teach you how to do it based on your particle estimate of the marginal. Oops, I meant to have the pointer there. So we've got um, a particle estimate of the posterior that is this weighted sum of impulses. And I've got this, this plot up just to remind you that we've got uh, impulses that each have different areas, really,
uh, that are represented by the weights for each of our particles. So we've got weighted impulses, and showing a pseudo-colored image of impulses is really hard to do. <laughs> you know, I, I can sort of do it in one dimension, but if I turned this upside down and did this as an image, I wouldn't exactly know how to show you where an impulse was, much less how, how high it was. Like, it's just, it's, it's a problem. And it turns out that there's a straightforward way um, to um, handle this. Um, there's a popular method of density estimation where you basically add bumps together. So rather than working with an impulse, which has um, unit area, but is infinitesimally, has an infinitesimal extent and an infinite height, instead we convert those impulses to bumps uh, that have also have unit area or have area equal to the weights, um, but are, are smoother and are something that enable us to create an image that you can actually use for visualization. So this is a, this type of, uh, this general area is called density estimation, and there are entire classes in uh, graduate courses in statistics on density estimation. This is a pretty deep, can be a pretty deep field. But kind of a, a simple way that's pretty effective is to use what's called kernel smoothing or kernel density estimation. And, um, and again, essentially what you're doing is taking your density estimate and convolving it with these, these so-called bumps. And the bumps are different than, um, I, I think of them as sort of crude low-pass filters, but they're different than low-pass filters because low-pass filters usually have an impulse response that can be negative at some points. But because we're estimating a density and we want to make sure that the density is neg never negative, these bumps also have to be non-negative, and they're usu usually unimodal. And that's a weird low-pass filter to have one where the impulse response can't be negative. But it turns out if, if you look at their frequency response, they... Um, it goes down with frequency, such as Gaussian, that's right. So um, the kernels, or these bumps, um, have the properties that they are non-negative everywhere, and they, um, they integrate such that they have unit area. So they have unit area, and they're non-negative, just like a PDF. PDF has those two properties also. And again, filtering impulse, convolving with impulses with these bumps is, is basically what we're going to do. It, so, because you're doing a convolution, it's a type of filtering, and you can think, well, what kind of filter am I applying? If you look at the frequency response of any of these bumps, you'll see that it decreases with frequency, and that's why I think of these as low-pass filters, being having that background signal processing. <coughs> so, the when you do that convolution, the kernel density estimation ends up simply being a weighted sum of these bumps. Uh, you know, each each impulse, you convolve an impulse, you get whatever it is you're convolving it with, located at that impulse. So we get the bumps centered at where the particles are at that time. And um, I've, I've described this as a function B sub sigma. Sigma is a parameter that you choose. It's the most important parameter that you choose, and it controls how wide the bump is. Because the bump has got to be shorter if it's wider to make sure it has unit area, uh, it turns out that one way of scaling this is to start off with some basis function, such as Gaussian, and then if you scale it this way, uh, then it, it will it scale it in such a way that it continues to have unit area. Basically, as you make it wider, it becomes shorter, and the, the net result is that it continues to have unit area. So it's simply a scaling factor. Um, bumps like Gaussian are popular. They usually have even symmetry, and they're usually unimodal. Um, they don't have to be, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone do this with a bump that didn't have those properties. Um, if we apply that to the simple one-dimensional example uh, where we've only got 25 particles, this is one of the things we saw before where the posterior that we're trying to estimate is shown by blue. In this case, we've only got 25 particles shown by these black lines. Um, the importance density is shown by green. The, uh, the weights or the areas of the bumps are shown by the... Um, by the, uh, the height of the black vertical lines, which coincides with this smooth weighting function, which is just the ratio of the posterior to the importance. And then I plotted on this plot also every single individual bump that I'm going to add together. And so, you know, the, it's, each bump has unit area, but I'm scaling it by the weight. The sum of the weights is one. So if you add all these bumps together, um, their net area is one also. And uh, when you add them all together, you get the thing shown by the kind of dark reddish brownish line. And when you look at that and you compare it to what we're trying to estimate, this uh, blue thing, you're like, well, 
that could be pretty misleading. It looks like the mean is kind of shifted to the right. It looks like the estimate is going to lead us to believe there are <coughs> modes there when there really aren't. It's really just an artifact of the estimator. Um, and uh, so it makes it look multimodal, and it makes it look as though the mean is in a different place. But if we increase the number of particles to 250 by a factor of 10, because computation is cheap and it's 2016, um, should have pro probably made it much bigger, we end up with an estimate of the posterior that is far better. And asymptotically in the limit, it'll become perfect. So if I had 25,000 particles, visually you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the posterior and the estimate. Okay, so that's one way of going from all these vertical black lines where I can't really convert that into um, a smooth function that you could plot and, and actually being able to estimate what the density is from our particles. Does that make sense? It was, a, it was a very quick tutorial on kernel density estimation, but it's a, it's a fairly simple technique that, um, that enables you to estimate the posterior and be careful with it because it can be misleading unless, unless you're careful. Yes? Um, so when you're doing the, that computationally, do you, uh, if you're using like a Gaussian function, do you, you compute the value of each of the Gaussians uh, scaled to the correct height, but you compute it at each uh, x value, and then you add it all, them all together, and then you do it over the whole range? Doesn't that mean you're, you're increasing your computation time by uh, n squared instead of by n? the more um, particles you have? That's an excellent question. The answer is yes, um, and, uh, and yes, that's bad. Um, it'll turn out there's a way around it, and, and part of the reason that you don't want to use a Gaussian, it turns out, is that a Gaussian has, um, has support over the entire real line. So technically, to do it right, and oh my gosh, all these uh, Gaussians are like squished or whatever kernel I use there, uh, but if you use a kernel that has finite support, then most of them are zero, and you really only need to do the addition in the neighborhood. And that's why you would need to do a sort. Like I think Andy was suggesting earlier, if you do a sort, then you can just add the particles that are within the range of your kernel. And so you could do computation a scale or something, something, and it would be uglier, but a uniform or something? Uh, I'll show you some good kernels to use in, in just a moment. So, uh, okay. Did you have a question, too? Yeah, I was, uh, was going to clarify kind of the same thing, but I think you already clarified it. Yeah, so. so I was thinking another efficient uh, way of doing the same thing would be to apply the, the bump on the CDF and then differentiate again to get the smooth CDF. So then you can do the convolution just once. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I'd have to think that through, but um, no one does it that way, probably for good reason, but I, I don't know why that wouldn't work. I'd have, to, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. You have to be careful in smoothing CDFs. CDFs have different property than PDFs, um, but It'll maybe work. I'd have to think about it. It's just another linear filter. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure because it's cumulative sum. Yeah, yeah, that, that could get messy. No one does it. We're only going to use it for visualization. You, you don't use it in practical tracking applications, just in the development of the tracker. So in some respects, the computational uh, cost of this thing doesn't matter that much. What about if you want to derive a confidence interval? Um, you don't need it. Okay. You don't need it. You can do that straight from the particles. Because getting the CDF is really easy, and that's all you need for your percentiles from, from the particles. You don't have to smooth to get the confidence intervals. So you're okay in that respect. So um, these are popular kernels, there's more. Um, don't use the sync because it doesn't have the property of being um, non-negative, but all these others have that property. Um, it turns out asymptotically that Epanichnikov, I don't know if I said that right, but this kernel um, is asymptotically optimal in, in some way, but it's weird uh, because it's, um, it has, it looks kind of like this. I didn't draw that very straight. This is meant to be a straight line. But it looks kind of like that, where it has this point where the derivative is not continuous. So it itself is not very smooth, and so the estimates it creates are don't seem to be smooth, and yet if you add enough of them up, it becomes, it, it has some optimality properties that the others lack. 
I usually use this by weight function, but you know, it, it, it's really a matter of taste. It doesn't matter that much. Um, all these have a scaling constant, but think of that constant as just a factor to ensure that the area is equal to one. And a lot of these I've, I've multiplied by um, the unit pulse, which is just defined by, by that down there. None of this really matters that much. It's just a little bit of background. I'm not really trying to teach you about density estimation. I'm hoping that today I'll be able to teach you about particle filters. Um, the, um, the one critical parameter is not the shape of the bump, but it's the width of the bump. That matters a lot. And if you pick a bump width that is too small, it's going to look like it's multimodal when it's just estimation error. And if you pick it too big, it's going to look unimodal when it may actually be multimodal. You may smooth over the bumps. So you have to be careful about that. And there's actually a bias variance trade-off involved in density estimation that really comes down to that one critical parameter of how wide your kernels are. The larger you make it, the smoother your estimate is, which means you've got a more biased estimate, but it also means you've got less variability. And vice versa, when you make sigma small, uh, the opposite happens. You end up with um, something that's less smooth, that's coarser, uh, which means you've got less bias, but you've got more variance. Um, a good thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is we're usually looking at images, and there's usually some extent over which you're plotting. You know, there's some x min value down here, and there's some x max value up here. And uh, when you're thinking about the width of your kernel, you don't want to make it so small that it's less than a pixel, right? Because you, you've only got so many pixels that you're filling in between x min and x max. And if you're going to display it to your classmates on the projector, the range of x-min to x-max probably can't be more than a thousand pixels. So that bump width, you know, is a function of x-min and x-max. You don't want it so small that if there were multiple modes that you wouldn't be able to visualize it. So that kind of bounds how small, how small uh, you make your sigma. So think about that when you're, when you're picking the sigma uh, for display purposes. Um, and in the practical implementation, we, we already hit on these points and is part of the questioning. Uh, technically, at every single grid point, you'd have to add up all of the, the kernels, and we're going to do that for every time. So if you think about how the computation scales, if you've got 500 grid points, 500 vertical pixels, and you're doing it over maybe 200 samples, and now you've got maybe um, 500 particles or maybe 50,000 particles, depending on what you're doing, you multiply those all together and, and you're out of cycles. Like that, that doesn't work. So as I mentioned, um, a good thing to do is to sort your particles and use a kernel that has finite support so that you only have to add the ones that are within range of the kernel. And that reduces this computation so it's not order ng. It's still going to be npn but that takes out this ng factor and makes that a uh, finite constant. So there is, uh, it, it makes the computation far better. And you can see my MATLAB code is an example of um, how to do that efficiently. I'm going a little bit fast through this because this isn't the main point of the lecture. It's just this is how we get at a way of doing density estimation. And this um, one small word of caution, this can be done in higher dimensions, um, but don't. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it becomes very it becomes inaccurate very quickly as the dimensionality grows. It's, it's yet again the curse of dimensionality that kind of bites us here, and it makes this really hard. In one or two dimensions, it's fine, but if you go beyond two dimensions, um, it, density estimation in more than two dimensions is very, very hard. So um, don't. <laughs> Even if you could do it, how would you like look at it? Exactly. Yeah, that's true, too. Even in two dimensions, you'd be like, you're going to have to look now really at a movie, almost, of how things are moving with time. And I've had students do that in the past, because often when we're tracking where things are spatially, like they were tracking, I think they were tracking a uh, fish in a stream, and there was a rock in the middle of the stream, and it was really cool to see that uh, as time goes by, you couldn't tell if the fish were on one side or the other side of the rock, so you saw the posterior kind of branch out and then come together. Um, but they had a nice way of visualizing is a movie where, where time was like different frames of the movie. And, and so in that case, we were doing it in two dimensions. But beyond two, all bets are off. Forget it. I mean, and, you know, there's much more to be said about that. But this isn't a class on density estimation. We really only need it for this. So, um, so I did density estimation. Uh, on our example, thinking back, remember we've got the car going around the racetrack and there's this bifurcation and it stops being able to track the state about here. 
And when I apply the kernel density estimation, and I apologize that I didn't list the kernel width here, but you know, you, you based on this range and what I just said, um, and actually I happen to know that that this is a single bump, and so you can see the width is about, I don't know, if this is a space of one, and that width is probably um, plus or minus a sigma, it looks like it was about 0 0.1, 0 0.2, somewhere in that range, plus or minus, this is plus or minus 0 0.2, so from the green to the top of the black there is uh, half the kernel width, or I guess is the kernel width. Um, so uh, if you look at this, um, it's, it's great here, and it's terrible over here. And I'm using yellow now to, to just as a visual cue to distinguish between the estimated confidence intervals with the particles from the true confidence intervals estimated with optimal tracking that we talked about before. So yellow is particles, pink is uh, true. And if we look at them side by side, and Scott, we may need you to kill the lights again. Um, and I, I can't really zoom in because they're, oh gosh, that's terrible. You guys can't even hardly see the yellow. Well, I, I apologize for that, but um, I guess you're gonna have to, for those of you that are, are seeing this live, you're gonna have to take my word for it that um, it's accurate, uh, it's accurate for the, about the first 20 samples. The confidence interval is really good. You can just barely faintly see the yellow when, when you're here in person. You can kind of see that this is white and that's yellow. The projector just doesn't have very good color depth. Um, but when you look at them side by side, really good for a while, and then everything breaks down. And over here, it's terrible compared to what the true is. The true is kind of multimodal, you know, it's having a hard time. It's kind of on the edge, and for some reason the car was on the edge for a while. But our particle estimate is, is way off. And that's due to that problem with the weights that we saw. Scott, can we have the lights back on? Keep you awake for this part. So. What went wrong? Uh, what went wrong is that we ended up with this. Our estimate, if you're just thinking about the mean, is this weighted sum of all the individual components. But effectively, all the weights were zero except for one particle after a certain number of samples. So we ended up really just tracking one particle, and all the other particles were just wasted cycles because they didn't really influence our estimate. The weights were so small, we would have been better off just leaving them off and saving the cycles and having it run slightly faster. Um, the performance rapidly deteriorated because all the weights headed to zero except for one. So why did this happen? And the answer uh, comes down to, um, the, the way I think about this is we're kind of playing Russian roulette. Um, I know that's a gross example, but it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's how I think about this. Um, the weight is equal to what the weight was, not plus, but times the likelihood Time, the likelihood times the prior times the previous weight. If the previous weight was super small for some reason, then it doesn't matter if this is big and this is big. If that was effectively zero before, it's going to stay zero. Uh, similarly, if when we're advancing our, our, um, our particles forward in time, if we happen to draw an, an, an unlikely transition, you know, the car on average is going two degrees forward, and let's say we, we draw a particle because we're drawing from the same distribution, but we draw one where, um, where the car actually goes, um, oh, I, this is a little bit off, but, but uh, um, bear with me because in general this reasoning is true. If we happen to draw a particle where it is a long ways away from, from what the process model says it ought to be, then this could be zero. And as soon as that's zero, then the weights for that particle are going to be close to zero from that point forward. And like, likewise, likewise with the likelihood, if we end up picking a, uh, a state for that particle that is inconsistent with our measurement, so the likelihood is really small, and that drives it closely to zero, it's going to be close to zero from that time forward. Now, the only thing is that one of the weights is going to win because we know it's normalized such that the sum of the weights has got to add up to one. We always divide by the sum. But these things, because there's this multiplicative effect, these things are screaming towards zero because it's this, this multiplying effect of things that, that mostly are just going to make it smaller. We're not usually amplifying. We're usually attenuating when we're, when we're doing this multiplication. And so um, trying to draw state trajectories that are, are probable consistently over the entire history of the trajectory 
and are consistent with the measurements because of this likelihood is just really, really hard to do. So what we end up with is a bunch of trajectories, none of which is probable, all of which are very improbable, but they, they're they improbable at sort of an, an exponentially worsening rate. And so you end up with just one winning because they're, they're scattering at such a rapid rate when you multiply them together. So what this kind of comes down to again, once again, is the curse of dimensionality. I sort of told you particle filters would beat it. And I think I put an asterisk on that or said sort of or something. And this is one of the ways in which it, well, not quite, uh, because... If we can make our importance density equal to the product of these two so that this was one, then we would be fine. But we can't. Uh, we've got some importance density that is different than these two, and so we've got these weights that are getting pushed around, and they're scattering apart at a really rapid rate, which means one of them is going to win pretty rapidly. And you end up really just tracking a single particle, and that's no good. Um, that means our estimates become bad and lots of other things happen. Um, there's a way of quantifying this uh, with what's called the effective sample size. So, and again, I apologize for the notation. N sub E means number of effective particles at time N. <laughs> Sorry, I, did, I didn't know how else to handle that. Maybe I should have used a capital letter N, but I didn't. So, number of effective particles at time N. And one way of, uh, one metric for that that works quite well is, is given by this equation. It's bounded where the number of effective particles is always going to be greater than or equal to one, and it'll be less than or equal to the number of particles. If they all have the same weights, then it's equal to the number of effective particles. If just one of them uh, has all the weight, then it's equal to one. So this is a pretty good estimate of how many particles are effectively being used for your estimate. It's, it's a good measure. And if we, I'll repeat some of this next time. If we look at this in our example, the number of effective particles, because they all start off with a, a uniform weight, starts off at 500, but it drops precipitously, and by about time 20, we're down to roughly one. You know, it can't be less than one, but it gets down to one and, and pretty much stays there from that time forward. So we're essentially trying to estimate this multimodal posterior distribution now with, with a single particle with a single impulse from that time forward. So things are broken, and, uh, and finally, here's the solution. If you understand this, then, then you can track really high dimensional problems reasonably well. Um, the, the trick that people use is they resample the distribution. So uh, basically what you do is we, we go to our particles and we say, some of you we're gonna get rid of, and some of you we're gonna get copies of. So we, we look at our particles and we look how probable they are, we reach into the hat, and the, the odds of us drawing a particle, the probability of us drawing a particular particle is proportional to its weight. So as with higher weights, we, we grab more frequently, and we do it with replacement. So we grab a particle out of the hat, and then we put it back in and we draw again. And a particle with a very high weight, we would draw many times. Um, and the particles with very low weights get left in the hat and we never see them again. So, you know, in, at a high level, that's how this resampling works. Um, we resample with replacement. We put them back in the hat. Um, and, and what triggers that, what people usually do, you, you could resample every time step, but it, it takes cycles. So some, a lot of people don't. They'd rather spin their computation and having more particles. So most people will track how many effective particles you have. When that drops below some threshold, you resample. And as soon as you resample, everything gets a uniform weight again. Suddenly you've got 500 particles to work with again. So you can resample as often as you like, um, but you usually keep the number of particles constant. Uh, for those of you that have a strong background in statistics, this is very similar to bootstrap estimation techniques. And the new particles are drawn with, uh, with a, a probability that's proportional to their weight. The re resulting sample is uh, arguably IID, and so we can assign uniform weights to the resampled particles. And um, I will go over a lot of this again, um, but I, I want to get to the main point and not dwell too much on the, um, on the logistics. So I'll go over a method for implementing this efficiently um, next time. You'll also find it in that chapter three. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I just want to show you how this works. This is just a cute computational way of um, making that really efficient.
So here's our <coughs> tracking problem. We've seen this before. Um, here's a different plot of what's happening with the particles when you do resampling. Remember before that things broke down at time 20, but it hit the resampling threshold. I'll probably set it at 10% of the particle. So when it gets to 50, resample. So it resampled here because you can see the particles were scattering out, but the particles way down here were very improbable. They had very small weights and they were not chosen when I did this random resampling because their weights were so small, they simply weren't drawn. When I reached into the hat, I didn't pick those. But I picked these, a lot of these, again and again and again. And so there's sort of, suddenly there's duplicates. You know, a lot of these um, trajectories start off to be the same, but when they, when they move forward, they start to scatter away from each other again. Because when I move them forward, I move them forward from the process model, and I'm, I'm doing that randomly. So after you resample, they start to move away from each other, and then at some point, you, you have this degeneracy occur again, and you resample again. So all the particles that were in here, that was improbable. That was in between two different modes. And so those particles weren't chosen in the resampling. The ones that survived were down here and down here, and there's duplicates there. And then again, they start to scatter as you move forward. So this is what it looks like. And you can see now the particles cover before the, the trajectory in the true state was up in a place where there weren't even any particles. But now, uh, with resampling, the particles are, are, are it looks like where they should be. Um, this is what it looks like in terms of the weights. Um, you can see again, all the weights head to zero, but then they resample and they all get reset to having the same value. And you can see when the resampling events occur because the variance goes down and all these weights that were set to zero suddenly get, get reset. This is what the effective number looks like. You can see my threshold was at 50, because it comes down, hits the threshold, gets resampled back up to 500, drops. I'm not sure why it got resampled there. Maybe, got, maybe it suddenly dropped to 50 and hit a resampling event. It looks like it, and so on. So you can see each resampling event is when this gets reset back to 500. Resampled quite a bit. And most importantly, this was the main slide that I was really eager to get to uh, in today's lecture. I'll, I'll go back after over some of these points. Um, this is, is, is uh, I use the word beautiful too much, this is great, this is fantastic, uh, because this posterior, for, forget about whether it's estimating where the true state is, what we really care about is whether we have a good representation of the posterior. Um, you know, the true state is not always going to be where the posterior is, but you can't beat the posterior on average, so that's really what we want to track. And this tracks it um, beautifully, it's not perfect. Uh, you know, this is, looks a little bit kind of pixelated, and it's not quite as smooth as optimal, uh, but it's dang good. And especially if you look at it side by side, you know, I advance forward, this is the optimal. So it's a little bit smoother. But you can see now the confidence intervals um, match the actual confidence intervals really well, except for a weird case here where the 2.5th percentile suddenly jumps, and, you know, the particle filter caught that a little bit late. But for the most part, it's even tracking the edges of the... 2.5th and 97.5th percentile really, really well. Um, and the mean now, it's not perfect, but it's dang good. Um, you know, now we're looking out some number of samples into the future, and you can see the, the green and the blue are really close to one another. So, um, so you know, fantastic, because unlike the optimal method, um, this is something that you can use uh, even in high dimensions. You can track anything with this. And here they are side by side. So again, it's not perfect. Um, you know, this isn't quite as smooth uh, as this. And sometimes you might have something that kind of looks like an extra mode that isn't. Those aren't good examples because it's covered by the legend on this side. Um, I guess here's an example where it looks like there might be a little extra mode here, but really that's just an artifact of only having 500 particles and the kernel density estimation. We can see in the true optimal that it's not there. But nonetheless, really, really close. It really captures the structure. The mean is in the right place. The percentiles are in the right place, more or less. Like, pretty much nails it, I think, is a particle filter. And all we had to do is implement that resampling. Um, this... Um, this works well, even in high dimensions, nonlinear, non-stationary processes. The algorithm that we just went through, where we've got the simple algorithm, but now with resampling, 
will work very well for, for almost anything. It may take a lot of computation, but like this is it. If you guys can drive this, um, then in some respects you don't really need to know about the instance of common filter and all the other things we're going to learn about. Um, the decisions we made work in high dimensions as well. A lot of people use this, and it works well for solving a lot of different problems. So we will, we will spend more time. I know I, I rushed a little bit at the end, but I wanted to get to the punchline. I'll go back after the, over these points, and especially resampling on, on Thursday. But I wanted to get to, to this example so you guys could see how well this works. Any, any brief questions before we break? So the resampling seemed kind of arbitrary. At least it's not as elegant as the rest of, rest of it. Yeah, you're and, absolutely right. And there have to be like so many different ways the same thing could be done, like get new samples, which are not too small. And so this is probably one of them. Uh, is this the best performing one? Why would we choose this? Yeah, OK. So those are all good questions. Um, uh, and you're right, the resampling is, is not elegant. I guess, I guess myself, if, if we're going to start making sort of principled objections or aesthetic objections, uh, I would have said um, doing tracking that is driven by so many random number generators is insane. Like, I, I think I expressed that earlier. Like, we're, we're doing tracking now with random numbers, and, and that, that drives me crazy. I don't, I don't like, as an engineer, uh, <laughs> having developing algorithms and saying, this is great, and having it driven by a random number generator, where every time I track, I'm going to get a different estimate, even if I've got identical measurements. So if we're going to start making principal or aesthetic objections, it's... It doesn't stop at resampling. Um, resampling is kind of ugly. Um, I agree with that. Um, uh, and there's another design decision in terms of where you set the threshold, if you're going to base it on the number of affected particles, um, where you have to, you're going to have to be able to make that decision. Um, I agree with all that. But I can tell you we're going to spend the next probably two, two and a half weeks talking about better methods of doing particle filters. Um, but of those methods, the gain in performance over what I just showed you is marginal. When it, when it comes down to it, um, this very simple algorithm, even with its inelegance of resampling, works well as long as you've got enough particles. There, there are better ways of doing everything. In importance density, we can, we can do better. Resampling, we can do better. But at the end of the day, um, what we're basically doing is taking advantage of the fact that computation is cheap. If you've got enough computation, this kind of brute force technique will work just as well as those others if you've got enough particles. So with this, you can, you can get busy and start tracking. It uh, works really well. And the, the danger of resampling too much was just a trade-off of computations for that uh, resampling, or you end up trusting your measurement? I, I will. Much? No, it doesn't have anything to do with trusting your measurement too much. It's really only computation. And some people will, will say, oh, well, I'm going to avoid this whole issue of picking a, a threshold or even having only, you know, 10% of my particles being effectively used and, and having that variance. I'm just going to resample every time step. But resampling does take computation, and that's computation that otherwise could have been invested in particles. So as engineers, you know, if you're going to be working with these particle filters, you've got to be thinking about, I've got a computational budget and what's the best way to allocate that budget? And that's probably the, the better <coughs> framework to apply that decision of, am I going to resample every single time step, uh, which would be better, but at the expense of computation, or am I going to invest that in having more particles and resample less frequently? So that's, that's where that, where that trade-off lies. And I will say more about that on Thursday. We should, we should probably stop there. I'll take, uh, we'll have much more discussion on Thursday.